Right, let's get started. Um, <clears throat> welcome to the everyone that has attended the session about building your first connection with Kafka. Uh, my name is Ricardo, and I'm uh, I'm gonna share the, the, my contact details in a moment. Uh, but just a heads up for everybody that is attending the session: this is going to be a very heavy demo session. So, throughout the following, throughout the next thirty minutes, I'm gonna be showing how to build your connector. Uh, basically, there are no slides. I'm basically gonna use an IDE for showing how to code and how to structure your code and how to do your implementation. So any questions that you might have, please hold them until the end, right? Uh, let me start sharing the screen so we can share my details of. Uh, all right, so hopefully you can see my screen. Um, the title of this presentation I call Building Your First Connection for Kafka Connect because the whole intention of the presentations is to show and share uh, what it takes to for you to build a connector with Kafka, right? Um, so many of you actually uh, might have experiences before with Kafka using it as a messaging platform, or as a message broker, or a streaming platform. Uh, but from time to time, you might have the uh, the need to actually uh, integrate Kafka with some other technologies, right? And for those of you that that know Kafka very well, you know that there is this framework called Kafka Connect, which acts as the integration layer for Kafka, right? Um, it works pretty well, uh, obviously, right? But the reality is that from time to time, you also have to deal with technologies that don't have connectors available. Uh, you name it, like for any specific technology that maybe is too new or maybe it's too old. Uh, it might be the inverse sometimes. Uh, and for those huge cases, you, you you actually have to know how to build your own, right? That, that's the trick, right? And this is what, what's going to be the session about. Um, this is my Twitter handle uh, right here in the bottom. So for those of you that care to follow me on Twitter, uh, from time to time, I actually share some content about Kafka and streaming technology. So keep those in mind, right? Um, for for those of you that don't know me, actually, my clicker probably is not in the right time. Yeah, now it's working. So for those of you that don't know me, my name is Ricardo, right? I'm a developer advocate in this company called Elastic, uh, where I'm part of the community team. So Basically, what I do 24 by 7 is to connect people and developers with knowledge. For that, that's pretty much the essence of what I do as a developer advocate. Um, and also, um, I, I'm part of the Kafka Summit PC member. Um, for those of you that know this conference, which is pretty good, um, also, I'm part of the committee that actually does, does the selection of which talks is going to compose the final agenda. So I've been doing this for since last year. and. I have have been like lucky to kind of share this uh, position with other very smart folks from the community as well. Uh, those are my main contacts. So this is my email from Elastic Rifray at elastic.co. And this is my personal email. If you care to like get in touch for anything that's not necessarily has to do with this presentation or with the technology that I often talk about in conferences and meetups. Uh, so rifray at rifray.com. Right? And as I mentioned before, this is my Twitter handle. So, um, in, not in this presentation, but in the next one, the three hand is going to be available on all the slides, right? Um, as I mentioned before, this presentation is going to be heavily demo based, so there is no slide. So in order to prove to you, this is actually the, the final and next slide of this presentation. So I'm actually going to um, close this window right now because we don't need it anymore. Um, and pretty much what we are going to do is to play with this um, GitHub repository right here. So just a heads up, uh, in this session, we're going to focus on building connectors for Kafka. There will be a next, uh, second session that I'm going to literally deliver after this presentation, which is going to cover all the concepts and some of the underlying uh, understanding about what Kafka is and what Kafka does. So if you're new to Kafka, I would highly encourage you to uh, keep in the session, right? It's going to be literally right next to the session. So uh, maybe the sessions might be a too, too advanced for you. But for those of you that know Kafka already, this might be your chance to know how to build a Kafka connector, right? So uh, this is the uh, this is a GitHub repository that I've created that actually has a skeleton of a pre-built connector for Kafka, right? 
I've built this because uh, I uh, about four months ago and I've put myself in the seat of developers wanting to create their own connectors. And what I found is that there's a lot of documentation out there, uh, specifically from the Kafka uh, Apache Kafka documentation website from Apache route that teaches you the concepts, the architecture, and a little bit of the uh, the Java API that's uh, that's behind the, your building your own connector, right? But what is not available out there very easily is uh, a skeleton of code that gives you everything that you, you need to actually start with the right foot, right? And this is exactly what this uh, REPL does. So uh, I'm gonna share this link here on the comment session. So we can all have, uh, I'm gonna post it right here session so everybody can actually have a copy of it and then what i'm going to do is to start with the demo right so i'm going to clone this wrapper right here and i'm going to spin up an environment that is based on docker uh that is available here and this is has a pre-built connector that i'm going to deploy it and show if it's work right uh and then we can start from there like if it's working i can start walking through the how the code is structured and what are the uh implementation aspects that you have to know about it Right, so let's start with the first most obvious step, which is cloning the REPL, right? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna actually create a, a new terminal over here. Uh, somewhere my terminal ended up in the second monitor, but I can create a new window over here. So I'm gonna zoom in a little bit because I know that's when we share our screens in a conference, sometimes the font size is not too big. Hopefully this is going to be enough and so what I'm going to do, I'm going to create a directory here called ApacheCon on my temp folder, right? So I'm going to actually get there. So I'm going to uh, execute my IDE right here in this folder. So I'm doing this because I want to show you how to actually start from fresh, right? So this is um, literally uh, a new fresh folder where actually I should not have started the IDE yet. So what I'm going to do here is actually to git clone that REPL that I've just copied, right? So I'm going to clone it right here. Okay, so now we can actually start code referencing that project. And this is the project that I've mentioned before is available on GitHub. So I'm going to explain the structure of this project in a moment, right? But uh, I like to ex I like to start by explaining what the code does, right? Because as a developer, if you're looking to what the code does, you might be a little more comfortable in understanding what is the code behind it and what it does, right? So the first thing I'm going to do here is to uh, uh, actually let me increase the font size a little bit. Uh, and for those of you that maybe are struggling to see the font size, if you double tap your screen, on hop in, you might you might actually zoom in a little bit, so it might be a little bigger for you. So, as I mentioned before, as part of this code is based on Docker, right? So there is a uh, Docker Compose YAML file over here that, in order to use, you actually have to have Docker Compose installed on your machine, right? All the code has been written in Java because this is the programming language where the Kafka Connect framework is available. Right, and you gotta also have to be uh, stellar on your computer, Maven, right? Because the whole code build is based on Maven. So, and um, this is what I'm gonna do right now. I'm gonna actually uh, build this project. So I'm gonna clean and package. So it's going to generate a new deployment deployment archive, right, in the folder. So just for you to to know. The file that's going to be generated is going to be this one over here, right? Uh, actually, generated sources, components, packages. Yeah, that's right here. The zip file over here, that's your deployment unit for Kafka Connect, right? So this is what you are actually going to uh, deploy on a typical Kafka Connect uh, clustering, right? But we're going to talk about the project stru structure later. Now that we have built the project, we can actually start up environment. So I'm going to start up environment as a daemon over here. So this Docker Compose basically has a Zookeeper, uh, a, Kafka, a Kafka Broker installed, and a Kafka Connect as well. So let's follow log the logs to see if the server started up uh, appropriately. So 
So there, uh, in this Docker Compose, there are basically three instances of Docker components, right? So the first one is Zookeeper, the Kafka Broker, and Kafka Connect. Uh, you know that Kafka Connect is actually uh, running in its own JVM that connects to the Java uh, to the Kafka Broker. So those are two separate deployments. Okay, so the Kafka server is up, and I'm going to actually split this terminal over here because I want you to see what is going to happen after start playing with the connector, right? Right now, there's no connector deployed. The connector has been built, but hasn't been deployed, right? So uh, the only thing it's running right now is the Kafka Connect server. So what I'm going to do, and actually, when you do this by yourself, you can follow the instructions here on a GitHub uh, REPL. So the first step is obviously what we just did, which is building the, the project. The second step is to start up the Docker Compose. And the third step is to actually deploy the connector, right? So this is a curl command. Uh, I'm going to run it over here, right? As you can see here, this curl command is going to post a to this endpoint over here that is exposed by the Kafka Connect server under the port 8083, right? And basically has this JSON payload that comprises the connector deployment details, right? I'm going to show in a second, but let's deploy it for a second. So as you can see here, when the REST endpoint uh, finishes, the, the deployment happens, right? So now we have the connector actually, what this custom connector does is to, for every five seconds, it keeps pulling data out of nowhere, is a fictitious set of data that I basically wrote hard-coded in the code, just to emphasize that it can be reading for anything, right? Um, and what it does is basically, this is a source connector. So basically the role of the source connector is to read the data from a source system and bring it into Kafka, right? So considering that the data is on Kafka, we can actually expect this using this Docker execution. For those of you that know Kafka, you know what this um, Kafka console consumer does. So basically we are going to create a consumer that's going to keep pulling the data out of the uh, specific Kafka topic, which in this case, the Kafka topic source one. So what it needs to happen is that every five seconds, a new entry data from source one should appear over here. So yeah, it's working. So this is only to prove the case that um, what this uh, skeleton does is to give you a pre-built and pre-written code that contains a Kafka connector that is ready to go, right? Obviously, when you start building your own, you, what you want to do is basically clone this REPL and uh, basically change the code to do to, to satisfy the requirements that you already have, such as uh, writing the code that actually is going to connect with your source system. But all the skeleton code, which sometimes that's what I, I have felt actually when I was studying Kafka Connect, the Kafka Connect framework, which is sometimes it's not very trivial to understand, right? There is a little bit of a complexity, uh, inherent complexity on the Kafka Connect framework. Or, uh, it's not, it's not necessarily that's uh, bad documented, but uh, what I found is that the language that you use in the documentation kind of pre-assumes too much pre-knowledge, right? So uh, for those of you that started from scratch, that might be uh, some sort of struggle sometimes, right? So we've seen that's working. So I'm going to stop this console over here. Um, I'm going to exit. We don't need this anymore. And then I'm going to stop the Docker Compose that we've just started. So I'm Docker Compose here, and I'm going to actually set it down. Oops. Docker Compose down. Because now we're going to start discussing uh, the code structure, right? So the code structure is probably what matter the most, right? So, um, OK, so basically what I'm going to do right now is to show the code. Uh, so. Let me uh, minimize this window over here and bring back the project structure, right? So um, if you have any questions, please, I'm going to reserve kind of five minutes uh, to the end, right? Uh, so or just keep putting your questions on the chat. And by the time I finish this presentation, I'm going to go to the chat and walk through the questions that have been reading there, right? So don't worry uh, if you, you have any questions. So. Let me explain the code structure for a bit, and then after that, I'm going to 
dig deeper into the Java code itself. So the code structure is, forget about the Docker Compose. This is optional, obviously, right? You don't need to create a Docker Compose in order to build your Kafka Connect connector, right? The Docker Compose has been put here just for the sake of uh, what, what we just did, like to rapidly and quickly spin up an environment to test the connector, right? When you're testing, I think that might come in handy sometimes. So as I mentioned before, the whole code is written on Java and Maven. So this is the POM file that basically comprises everything you, let me close this, comprises everything that you, all the dependencies that you have to have in your code. So basically, as you can see here, you need the Kafka API, obviously, right? Uh, but the scope has been provided, which means that it's not going to be set on your final uh, jar files generated. And basically, this is all frameworks for testing purposes, right? Uh, I like to use test containers for testing because using test containers, you can actually spin up a bunch of uh, background Kafka containers uh, that uses Docker, right? But it's whole transparent for, 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 for your code. As the only thing, obviously, you have to have installed in your computer is Docker, but it is transparent. And that's it. So basically, the build file is going to generate that zip file that I've, made, that I've shown before, right? So let's talk business. In the source folder, you, you're going to have this two main folder, which is main and test. That This is a typical Maven uh, project structure, so you know what those means, right? And then you're going to have this uh, under Java, basically the main classes that we are going to discuss here, right? So we have five Java classes here, but I'm going to start with this simple question, right, which is, which of those Java classes are actually necessary and which ones are optional, right? And because there are optional Java classes here, uh, not everyone you actually have to write for building your own connector. So let me start uh, highlighting which, which ones are actually important. This one, all right? Let's call this one simply connector. Let's call it connector class, right? That's what you have to remember in your, in your, in your mind. And then you have the task class, right? So keep it open, okay? So those are the actually only classes required for you to build your own connector. Whereas I'm going to obviously explain the code structure in a bit, right? What you have to know right now is that any other Java class that I've created here was basically created for just organizing the code better, right? You know. You know the technique of simplifying a code structure, like breaking down the logic into multiple um, uh, files. So you you don't have that huge file that has all the logic for this. It's that basically the same concept, right? So uh, let me start discussing what the connector class does, and then you're gonna see that as we walk through this code, we're going to reference the other files, right? The other Java classes that I build for simplifying the code, right? So let's start with the main class, which is the connector, right? A connector is basically a class that extends uh, this, you know, this abstract class called connector, right? And there are two types of connector, right? That's the first thing you have to know. The first one is called sources, which is literally what we have built here. A source connector is the one that reads a, a source system and bring data into Kafka. And there's the sync connector, right? The sync connector, responsibility is to read data that is available in Kafka. So now the source of the, the, the source of the system is Kafka and you want to send to somewhere else. Like you're you were going to send the data that's in Kafka to some other system. So for this to happen, you have to extend for sync connector, not source connector. Okay. So keep that in mind because it makes a huge difference, right? Specifically in terms of behavior. So by the time you extend the source connector, there are some methods that you're gonna need to implement in your Java class. Those are going to be abstract methods that obviously do, you have to provide an implementation. So I'm gonna highlight them right now. So the first one is going to be the method start, okay? This is abstract, you have to provide implementation for it. The other method is tasks configs. This is abstract, you also have to provide an implementation for it and the method stop, okay? Those are the methods that you actually have to implement and provide code for it. Without it, the connector is not gonna work, right? What about the other one? What about the method of validate um, 
actually, I take that back. There's one more method that you have to implement, which is the task class. This is uh, mandatory as well, right? So all these methods, their responsibility is to basically create the framework that in runtime, okay, is going to spin up a bunch of tasks, right? So let's take time right now to understand what tasks are, okay? The best way to understand tasks is, is to keep in mind that whatever you write here, whatever code you write here in your connector is not going to do anything with data, right? It's basically a skeleton code that takes care of spinning up tasks, all right? Task is, is actually what the code that you were, you're going to handle data, okay? So you're going to decide right here on this connector if you're going to spin one, two, five, 100 tasks, right? Uh, you can think tasks in terms of threads, right? So, Ricardo, how do you handle concurrency in Kafka Connect when you're building a connector? Uh, very simple. You basically have to spread all your workload into multiple tasks, right? So, for example, if your your search system is a database, and maybe you are uh, you have in this database 100 tables, right? That's a lot, I know. But just imagine that you have 100 tables. So it is a good best practice to spin up one task per table, right? So you can actually uh, spread, the, spread the working, right? Uh, into one individual table per task in it. In runtime, what Kafka Connect is going to do is to spread all those tasks in the cluster. How? Nobody knows, right? This is basically the Kafka Connect clustering protocol that does this. You are supposed to not worry about this detail because that's what Kafka Connect does best, which is abstracting away details about uh, clustering, fault tolerance, and security. So basically, your job as a uh, connector developer is to decide how many tasks I need to spin up, right? And this is you are going to decide. There's no, the framework are not to detect this automatically, right? So uh, with that said, where you actually tell for the Kafka Connect framework how many tasks you are going to spin up. So this method here called task configs, okay, is going to receive as a parameter the maximum number of tasks that your code is allowed to handle, right? This is going to be a configuration that the user, not the developer, the user is going to, are going to set during the deployment of this connector, right? And this might be like a, a higher, a high mark saying that, right, do not spin up more than 100 tasks, for example, because uh, there won't be enough brokers or JVMs available to spin up all of them, right? But maybe this is, this is the reason for 100, but, this can be virtually any number. There's no actually limit for it. What you have to know is that this is going to dictate what you as a developer need to consider as the maximum number of tasks, right? So, in uh, here, basically what I'm doing is to create like a, I'm setting a list. You pay attention that we, you need to return a list of a map of configuration, right? So. The size of this list is going to dictate the number of tasks. If we take the example that I've, I've shared before about the database, right? If you have 100 tables, so the list size optionally needs to have uh, 100 as a size, right? So this is the best practices for maximum parallelism, right? Uh, so basically what the code needs to do is for each task needs to have their own set of configurations, right? So the configuration here is the properties that the task needs to have in order to, let's say, communicate with the search system. Um, the database, for example, uh, in order, how do you connect to a database? You have to have the URL for, for the host. You have to know the port. If there's authentication in place, you have to know the username and password. So all, all those details are going to be actually the task properties, right? So you basically define those here, right? And you can actually inherit all those settings here because one of the matches that you create here is the, where is it? Uh, start here, over here. So in the start method, you actually receive a bunch of properties that the user set. So in the example that I've made before, right, which is basically, remember that JSON payload that I've used it for deployment purposes? Basic, that's what uh, the JSON payload over here. So as you can see here, I've set parameters that only make sense for my connector uh, over here, right? exactly. So all those parameters over here are going to be end up over here, right? Uh, 
And then you can use this moment here, the start method to actually perform some validation. Uh, things like, all right, see so if you set four to the parameter number X, you can ask, you can all have like uh, eight for the, param the parameter Y, something like this. Uh, the logic is gonna be yours. It doesn't have to follow any precondition specifically. But the point is, all those properties, you can actually save it for user later. That's what I've done here. So I've created a copy of this properties originally over here. And when you were actually defining the number of tasks, you can actually inherit all, the, all of that and either provide it as is for each task. Likely you are not gonna do this because each task might have their specifics. For example, uh, uh, each task for a database table might have the table name, which is unique for that task, right? The table name specifically. But you got a point. Basically, what you have to do is to spin up the tasks, right? Which task is going to be actually executed in runtime, you specify over here in this method called task class, okay? So as you can see here, it's very simple. You just need to return a class that represents your task class, which, and the code is this class over here, right? So let's discuss a little bit about the task class so you can better understand, as I mentioned before, the, the connector class. It's, it's important, obviously. Uh, without it, you, you no longer has the ability to deploy your connector. But remember that the connector class doesn't do anything, right? Uh, it's a placeholder that basically comprises the logic to spin up the tasks. And the tasks are going to be the implementation, the code implementation that you're going to handle data, right? This is probably where you're going to spend the majority of your time developing the connector because this is the class that you're going to set up code for connectivity. Uh, to handle fault tolerance. If there's transaction involved, that's where we're gonna put your transaction logic over here. So this is going to be potentially, right, a very complicated implementation, right? So uh, let's review the most important methods for, that you can step here. As you can see here, it's not very complicated in terms of structuring, right? Your code, your algorithm, right? That is going to be a little complicated because it depends on your use case you are implementing, right? But the code, the structure here is basically you have the start method, right? This method is very important because um, since this is a source connector, right, is probably is going to specify, establish a connection with a source system, right? One or multiple connections. If you want to have like some, some sort of a parallelism and handling IO or multiple connections, you name it, whatever you need to establish with the source system. So the best, moment to establish a connection is going to be here in the start method, right? Consequentially, you also have this method called stop that is the appropriate method for doing some uh, resources cleanup, right? So if you have some socket connection established or a network call has been established, this is the place where uh, it, when, when the user specifies that he or she is going to like undeploy the connector, uh, before the underlying processes, this method is going to be executed. So this is the perfect place to close all the underlying resources, right? And then we have the main method, which is the poll, right? The poll method is a method that is, first of all, is continuously executed on its own thread, right? So remember this, each thread on Kafka Connect represents a thread, okay? So what that means is that whatever you execute here is no is not going to communicate or have a direct path of communication with the other tasks, right? You have to take this in mind and write your code, specify that each task or thread is going to be self-sufficient, right? Everything they need to know, everything they need to in order to work with, they need to have already, right? So the spool method here is going to be executed continuously, right? In a while true type of uh, execution, right? So is it, it is up to you if you want to perform some sort of a throttling or perhaps you, you, you need to take pauses or uh, shorter periods of time where there will be no execution, you will have to control it over here. Like for, for, for the sake of the example, I've put here some threads leap, never do this, right? Uh, I've, I've, I've done this on purpose just to emphasize that I'm going to do a pause, but in a real load, in a real world, uh, you, you should never do this, right? This is a bad, bad, bad practice, right? But 
the reality is that sometimes you might need some to use some sort of a scheduler to perhaps like I want to execute this poll every five minutes, for example. So it is up to you to put this logic here. What scheduler algorithm or implementation are going to use? You decide it, right? That's the beauty of it, right? The point is, whatever you do here, your responsibility is to return a list of source records. The source records the, is self-explanatory, right? It's going to represent a record that has been read from the source system, right? And for each poll, you don't necessarily have to kind of return one single record. You can actually accumulate, perhaps you were reading the, the, the data from the source system in batches. So this is the best way for you to, all right, you're gonna batch and cache all those records that are coming from the source system, and then you are going to send them back to Kafka in a in a once, right? So uh, this is why you have this ability to um, create a list and fill this list with the, uh, more than one record, right? So it is considerably simple if you think about it, right? Uh, obviously, the, the whole complexity of a source connector here is going to be about connectivity and fault tolerance and things like that. But the, re the reality is that by the time you actually end up writing the code for the poll, you're probably going to do what you, as a developer, might be already familiar with. Uh, for example, let's talk about the, uh, the example of the database. Uh, maybe you can establish here on this start method, you can establish a JDBC connection, right? And hold cache locally, the JDBC connection over here in the task. And then on the pool, you're basically going to like issue some SQL statements for a database to query data and then you're going to assemble this list of source connectors. It, it, it is that simple. I mean, there's no complexity other than this. The complexity will come from by the characteristics that you want to bring into Kafka. Like, for example, oh, I want to I want to throttle this for reading every five minutes. You have to put a scheduler here, right? Or perhaps you want to read this on a distributed global transaction. So it, it will be your job to actually acquire a transaction monitor for a transaction coordinator that's running somewhere in an application server or somewhere. And then you're going to use it right here to enlist the transaction that you are going to do here. So the whole transaction, um, the global transaction can execute it atomically, right? So th this is the part where the complexity is going to be inherent to your use case, it's not necessarily inherent to how the Kafka Connect framework works, right? That's the beauty of it, right? The one thing I would like to uh, point out before we start wrapping up is that um, the source records has a very specific structure, as you can see here. So this is the constructor of the source record. Actually, I'm going to open real quick for you to see, right? Because there's some very important information here in this constructor. Some of them you don't need to set, right? For example, just to take it for an example, imagine that the record that you were reading or a document that you were reading doesn't have a key, right? If it doesn't have a key, you don't need to provide, you can provide a, a null for key and for the uh, the key schema, for example, because like I mentioned before, there has no key, right? Uh, same goes, for example, maybe you don't have the concept of a partitioning, right? So for, but for partitioning, just a parenthesis is, just let me give you an example of partition. So imagine a database table, right? So a database table is broken down in different roles, okay? So each role is going to have a unique row ID, right? So this is a very good example of a partition, right? So uh, partitions is um, a way to specify how a specific data set is broken down, right? Uh, if you're dealing with a NoSQL database, that might be, for example, um, perhaps the the item that you are dealing with, right? Uh, you, you, you name it. I mean, that, that's the, 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 the whole purpose of having a partition is for you to uh, accommodate your code more easily, right? It doesn't necessarily have to mean anything generically or specifically, right? So another one important uh, aspect here is this information about the source offset. This Believe me when I say this is probably the less obvious thing that you are going to see on Kafka Connect framework, right? That most developers, me included, when I was uh, doing this for the first time, is not going to be uh, pay a very good attention on it, but is an extremely 
powerful feature that in a production environment makes the whole difference. So in order for me to understand, to explain that what this offset does, let me put a, a situation for you right now. So imagine that you were reading a source system, right? That has, for example, maybe 100 records, just for the sake of example, right? And then your connector stop reading it. One, two, three, four, five. The objective is to read all of the records, right? And then by the time the, the, the connector is processing the record uh, 37, for example, right? Something on the Kafka Connect cluster happens, right? The, the broker goes down, right? Something in the network goes down. Uh, failures can happen all the time, right? So what's going to happen with your connector? Your connector obviously is going to go down, right? Along with the broker, right? Okay, so this is how, why fault tolerance is all about, right? So maybe you can spin up a new broker node of Kafka Connect and the task is going to be migrated automatically to this new Kafka broker node. This happens automatically. You don't have to code this. Right? That's the magic of Kafka Connect. But the reality is that you have to provide a way for the Kafka Connect, your connector, to resume the processing. This is where the information of the offset is important, right? Your connector has to have the responsibility of for each record that has, has been read from the source system, you have to set this information of the offset. So is store it along with the record in Kafka, right? Because otherwise, if you don't set this, look what's going to happen. Remember the example? It's stopping on record 37. If you don't set the offset, all the all the records when the task resume is going to be reprocessed from the beginning, which is record number one, two, three, and four and five. Therefore, potentially processing and generating some redundancy, right, in your code. And probably you don't you want this, right? Uh, this is probably the, 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 the thing that nobody is going to want, but you got the idea, right? So what I'm going to do right now is to, um, let me go back to this presentation here. I'm going to stop sharing for a moment, uh, and I will take a look on the questions that's on the chat. And if you have one right now, please, this is the time. I'm going to spend the next five minutes here so we can uh, answer the, the Q&A, right? So... Let me look into the chat. Can all of this, the Patrick Demers, and, uh, can all of this be done in Python? Patrick, I wish we could, but unfortunately, Kafka Connect framework, the SDK is only available on Java, right? Uh, so I think in a worst case scenario, I'm just wondering, Allah, I've never done it, Right, but you know, or you might know, that you can run Python on top on top of a JVM, right? We call this Jiton, right? So maybe what you could do is to actually write a code in using Python, right? And try to run this on Jiton because ultimately what you have to do is to provide your implementation on a JVM compilable language, right? That's the, the, the requirement, unfortunately. There's no native Python code, so Jiton could be your way out. Jens, thanks for recording a great session. Oh, um, my pleasure, Jens. I, I, I hope you like it. All right, so Patrick, not sure if you're, um, that answer your question about the Python thing, um, but it doesn't seem to have, okay. So Nicholas has, you said max task is given by user to Kafka Connect in that the connector needs to take into account. So what would the connector do if the mass X is smaller than needed? Uh, okay, that's a very great question, Nicholas. So one of the things that you can do, right, is to remember the whole purpose of setting max task is because the user is telling you about some infrastructure limit, right? If you go beyond that limit, you might overload the infrastructure that some, someone previous than you size it properly, right? So what you can try to do is to use your own concurrency strategy to break down the logic. So its task, for example, might, might be able to spin up their its own child threads, for example, right? You have to do this carefully, right? Because ultimately, this is still going to try to overload the environment that has been specified for you. The only thing that you are bypassing here is the criteria of task is per user. So now, it, it will be your responsibility to break down each task in, in its own thread. And most importantly, your code 
would have to control each one of those child threads, the life cycle of them. So this is one strategy, right? Uh, but yeah, that's basically what you can do. Okay, so Patrick, oh, interesting. So is Kafka connector for doing things other than publish and subscribe? What are some use cases for connector? Good question, Patrick. So uh, a very typical and common use case for connectors, Kafka Connect specifically, is to do CDC, change data capture. So imagine a use case where you have a, a legacy database that is whether running on a mainframe or maybe uh, uh, on some other platform, and you want that data that has been uh, transacted for the applications, right? You want to make that data available to some other systems, but you don't necessarily want to actually uh, interrupt the transaction that's going on with the application. So what you can do is to build a connector uh, for CDC purposes where you're going to read all the transaction log for the source database, and then you can stream that out into the interset applications, right? Actually, I'm going to put here on the chat, there is a very uh, interesting project from Red Hat, it's called Debezium.io. I'm going to just put here in the chat where there is some pre-built CDC based connectors written on top of Kafka Connect that you can use for this purpose. Okay. Uh, so I could break down to many sequential tasks here for Kafka. Yes, Nicholas, exactly. So the, each one sequential task is could be executed either uh, in a sequence or in parallel. That, that's uh, what I meant. Creating your own thread. I, I was thinking about uh, parallelism, right? But yeah, you can actually break down into sequ sequences as well, for sure. Can I do JSON parsing in JDBC Think dynamically? Uh, that's a very, very interesting question, Eldos. Um, so you don't need to do this, right? So Kafka Connect has some built-in and some freaking awesome capabilities to do parsing for known serialization, serialization technologies, such as JSON, Avro, Prorbuf, and uh, I think CSV. I'm not sure. Point is... You don't need to do this, right? If you want it, remember that method poll that I've mentioned before? That's the place where if you want to transform the method and do your own JSON handling, that's the place where you should do it. But uh, you don't need it. Uh, you, you, there's a property for your connector that you can simply say, all right, I want this output to be JSON. And then whatever format you have is going to be transformed for you. Yes, I have my next presentation right now. So unfortunately, we have to wrap it up. So thanks, everybody, for joining me in the session. And for those of you who are welcome to, to uh, keep up for the next session, right? But for this one, thank you for participating and see you out there.